Hello and welcome to the latest edition of What Does the Giraffe Say with me, Kathleen Retourne. We are an organisation that aims to connect people in the conservation industry with audiences around the world where they get to share their incredible stories of the work that they're doing. Today I am very happy because I am joined by Christina Zanate and she is a shark behaviourist and conservationist and she's going to be telling us all about the work that she's been doing in the oceans. So Christina, if I could hand over to you, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got passionate about the oceans and in particular why you like sharks so much. Hi Kathleen, thank you for having me. Well, um, I come from a family of the ocean and so I was brought up with the water, near the water, swimming, and it was always a part of my upbringing. Some people maybe are brought up closer to the mountains or hiking. My family was like really swimming. I, I cannot remember an age when I didn't have fin, fins and masks to go snorkeling. Uh, sometimes I was hanging on to my dad's neck and he will just take me somewhere and then he will leave me on the surface as he free dive down and with the mask I could actually see him. So the ocean has been always a central part of my uh, childhood uh, in a positive way. So game, family time, enjoyment. And it was very easy for me to make that transition into changing my life to, to join the ocean. The sharks were also part of a childhood dream. I always wanted to have sharks for friends. And when I came to the Bahamas 27 years ago to learn how to scuba dive, I actually realized that sharks were abundant and in, on all the dives. And so I made a quick decision to change my life and say, well, I'll go to the Bahamas and stay there, or dive a little bit, and, you know, swim with sharks, and then eventually go back home and pick up again my old real job. And, you know, one year after the other, we're here 27 years later. <laughs> <laughs> and do you think it was because your family was so passionate about the ocean that they installed that into you as well? I think so. I think I had two two things that went to my advantage is the entire family, both on my mom and my father's side, was uh, drawn to the water and brought me to the water. And the other one was my upbringing in Central Africa. I grew up between the savannah of the old, what was called the Zaire, so the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the rainforest of the Republic of Congo, the Congo. And so I grew up very close to nature. And I know it doesn't have really much of an ocean component, but when we drove from the rainforest down to, to the coast, to the very wild Atlantic Ocean, but it still had that openness to nature, that understanding of, li of animals in our lives, that a need for coexistence that is still uh, quite present or was still quite present in the upbringing that I had. And I think the two components were very important for me to bring me into this road. And then why, why did you always want sharks as friends? What was it that, that made you uh, feel attached to them? It was, honestly, it was, I'm pretty sure, one of the cheesiest movie that it, it was ever created about sharks. And I think it was called something, The Jaws of Revenge. I actually Googled it once. But the concept was that there was this guy that loved sharks and had a power to swim with sharks. We're talking about a movie from 1978, so four years after Jaws came out. And although the movie had some gory parts in which he used the sharks to harm the people who harmed the sharks, there was still this part, these beautiful images in which, of him swimming in the water with the sharks and being able to cruise through the water. And as a child i was looking at this movie and i'm thinking that is absolutely perfect this is what i want to do i want to have sharks for, for friends as i roam the oceans without my mom on my shoulder telling me that i need to get out of the water because i have blue lips <laughs> <laughs> and, and kind of following on from that as well i mean i always feel like when it comes to sharks jaws has an awful lot to answer for in terms of uh, perceptions of these animals why are people so intimidating? Why are they seen as like monsters? Um, and then how do you combat this? Well, Jaws, honestly, Jaws has nothing to answer for. Jaws was written as a novel and the movie was a work of fiction. It was not presented as a scientific book or a documentary. And I kind of like defend Jaws from that point of view because Jaws, let's not forget, inspire hordes of people into becoming interested in sharks. 
So yes, it scared a lot of people out of the water, but it also inspired a lot of people going, I, I want to learn, learn more about sharks. Is it true that they do this? So for me, the fear of sharks is more into our incapability of dominating the oceans. As the humans, we are very, very versatile. We are capable of dominating our environments. We can actually create heat out of ice. We can shelter ourselves in ice to protect. But once you're in the ocean, and I'm talking about without the use of all the fancy things that I use, the rebreathers, the scuba gear, the wetsuits, dry suits, we are hopeless. We have no metabolic capability to be there. We can't breathe. We can't see. We can barely swim. Um, and there's nothing in the ocean that we can use to our advantage. If I'm lost in a forest or in, in the rainforest or in a savanna, there's a, something in the environment that I can use to my advantage. In, in the ocean, it's not going to say, oh, I'm going to take a breath and huddle underneath a coral head and pass the night and they'll find me. I'm floating. So here comes now the perception of a large carnivorous animal, which is incorrect because we have over 520 species of sharks and the smallest shark in the world is the size of a pen right but we have this concept and they come in formidable capabilities they're perfectly designed there's nothing i think that is as perfectly designed as a shark to live in their own environment and so it's a representation of what we can't do and obviously it triggers that uh, feel that we have a humans is that we lost because we dominate so much of our environment, we don't come out of the door thinking that there's going to be something to jump on us, to eat us. But in the ocean, that risk is minute, very minute, but for whatever reason, it's triggered. And so it creates all these uh, uh, fears. The other part is the unknown. I think the most powerful thing about Jaws was not the end when the when the shark is pushing down on the boat. I think the most powerful part of Jaws is the entire unknown of not understanding what is it, how big is it, what's coming, when it's coming. Yeah. And so I think that what triggers our fears. And I mean, I think I think there's a fact that is something like we know more about what it, what there is in space, and we actually know about what there is in the ocean as well. Absolutely. We are thriving to go to Mars. And don't, don't get me wrong, a lot of these uh, space research has created a lot of the tools that we are actually using in advanced ocean diving and actually use uh, things that have been uh, tested to uh, send to Mars. And they usually give them to divers. It's like, oh, we want to send this in space. Well, space and the ocean have the same kind of like risks and issues so here diver why don't you test this for me <laughs> so space has created quite a, an amazing technology for us on the planet but we have not invested as much into understanding how our oceans work as much as we actually have invested into exploring space and it this is an issue that you could sit there and discuss it right because we like i said we benefit from space research but i think we do should also we have the universe on our planet and is that 71% of the ocean, I think it's an absolute unexplored universe. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, one of your mantras as well is for exploration, education and conservation. Um, can you talk us a bit through all these aspects and why you feel that that's so important to you? Yes, yeah, so, so as I grew as a diver, right? When I started as a diver, I was let's call it selfish. It was about my experience. It was about what I could uh, feel, what I could learn. But as that basically happened, I realized that it was way much more. So exploration is the first part of us humans. And I think it's one of the most beautiful characteristics of human where explorers are heart. And it's about learning the known, but also learning the unknown and sometimes questioning the known. It's like, well, this is the known. It's kind of like, are you sure? Can I question that? So the first part for me is exploration. Learn the known and unknown around us. And then you go into education. So that is personal education. So first I want to learn and I learn for myself. Then once I know and understand, I can share it. Only once I've done those two steps, I can go into conservation. Because if I don't understand it and I do not appreciate it, I will not be able to want to protect it. We usually protect really what we love. Uh, Baba Diom expressed himself extremely well in 1968 when he said, you know, we protect what we love. And I think the three things is a progression. 
so it's okay in the beginning to be an explorer for yourself and for your knowledge and then it's like oh wait but i can also share this after i have it and then what can i do with all this knowledge <laughs> and then how um, i've just put a picture up on screen here of one of the workshops that you've been doing um what's normally when you're when you're teaching the children what's normally their opinion of sharks and how have you seen any changes at the end so it's it's very interesting one of the things that worries me is a lot of them are intrinsically afraid of sharks and they have this set up mindset oh if i enter the ocean they will eat me and i'm thinking you may have not even been in the ocean yet well not in case of these children in this picture because obviously these are island children but uh I'm like you haven't even been in the ocean yet and yet you're already afraid of sharks where does it come from and so it's somewhere in our lifestyle sometimes it's even in our verbiage we don't even realize that we say things like that and so they come out automatically uh i remember i was on the pool deck one day and this kid was running towards the water and the mom said oh don't jump in the pool there's sharks in there they're going to eat you and I, and I stop in my tracks and I turn around and I said, um, may I ask, you know, I said, why you said that? She said, I don't want to jump in the water. I said, well, maybe, and I obviously just with her, but I was like, maybe you want to tell them that the pool is deep and there's a danger within the water itself. I said, but there's, you know, no need to create a fear in an animal because first of all, it's not in the pool. And second of all, is uh, the animal, as soon as you jump in the ocean, is not going to eat you or bite you as much as people expect that. So then their perception changes. Most of the kids are fascinated. They're just curious. They want to know. And I always have, you know, one or two that in the end are still like, well, so what is the most dangerous shark? <laughs> but I think if you can trigger their interest, then you can also trigger their um knowledge and then you can trigger really their love so a lot of kids the sharks are to kids kind of like dinosaurs yeah. so it's like they're scary but it's like well if i actually saw a dinosaur i would want to get close to it and it's the same <laughs> with sharks with kids they're like i want to actually get close to sharks so the uh, changes during these workshops are pretty impressive and then part of what you've been doing, you've been diving for an awful long time. Um, and how- Come on now, not that long, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that with the greatest respect. <laughs> I mean, you're an experienced diver. That's, that's probably a nicer way of putting it. Um, now, part of what you do, which I think is absolutely fascinating, is removing these um, fishing hooks out of uh, wild sharks that have been caught up. You know, and this is, this is something that humans have put on these animals. How on earth did you discover that you could get that close enough to be able to help the animal by removing these sharks? And what's the process you have to go through? So the sharks were coming close to me because I was having them already close to me. I was conducting tours for shark tourism. And in the process of the sharks that, start, that, that I knew uh, start showing up with hooks. And to me, it was the same uh, thought process when my dog walks out of the bush and lifts his paw because there's a thorn in it i go grab the paw and pull the thorn and so if you, it was the same kind of thing my shark uh, although it's a wild animal showed up with the hook i will try to remove the hooks and that's how it started at first i was very tentative i didn't jump in the ocean and did my first shark dive and start removing hooks it took me a few years to understand how the sharks moved at first i would just remove the one on the outside and then through the years i just developed a few techniques understanding which hooks works how which one is easier to grab which one is harder to grab but it's a very basic concept is the animal is hurting and I have the possibility of saving this animal. It doesn't mean I can save all the sharks in the world and I'm not pretending to go around the world and removing all the hooks from all the sharks. But if I can alleviate someone's pain, why not? I do not believe in the concept of the hook will rust is one of the most least empathic sentences that somebody can say, oh, the hook will rust is like, should we try with the nail in our heel? It's like, well, eventually will rust fall out. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> to me, it says I can do something. Um, I'm a believer in the story of the star thrower. 
and talks about a young man being on the beach putting starfish back in the water because they're caught up in a low tide. And an old man looks at, arrives there and asks him, what are you doing? And says, well, I'm putting the starfish back in the water. The low tide has caught them uh, high and dry. And the old man says, well, there's thousands of starfish and miles and miles of beach. And this is not the only beach. You, you will never make a difference. Yeah. And so the kid picks up that one starfish and puts it back in the water and says, I made a difference for that one. And I think if we all did a little bit, uh, maybe we can't really save the world, but if we can make the difference in the world of someone, yeah. maybe we save their world. Yeah. And it's good to be doing something rather than nothing, yeah? To me, yeah. So do a little bit of something rather than expecting to do the big uh, nothing. I was like, oh, I can't really uh, save all the sharks in the world, so I'm not going to do anything about it. It's like, well, no, I can actually do certain things. And I, I'm not inviting, <laughs> let me take this chance to say, I'm not inviting people to jump in the water and try to remove hooks from sharks, especially sharks they're not familiar with, animals they've never seen before. There's other ways that we can help sharks. I have this direct capability, but the hooks and my sharks, my group of sharks have become ambassadors. So when people say, well, how can I help sharks? And that is the question. How can we help sharks? Well, we can look into the legislation of the country we live in. Are the sharks protected? Can you do something as a voter, as a petitioner, as an educator to change the perception about sharks? Can we change the legislation about sharks? And we can start with that. Can we change the way we consume things, reduce pollutions? Can we change the way we travel and expect certain things to be for us so that there's less deforestations, less mangrove removals, less pollution? So maybe we go back and we start checking. When I travel, what do I need? Always a five-star hotels, we love this, or can I actually adapt to more local environment? And is my traveling benefiting the local people? That is a big one, right? My traveling benefits the local people, not the big corporation, then the local people are more in tune in saving the little corner. So there's a lot of things that we can reduce in plastic pollution. So. And have you found when you're, when you're talking just then and you're talking about governments, have you found that there's been an improvement of legislations and, and people are starting to really respect what the sharks bring to conservation and the ecosystems or is there still a long way to go? Uh, both. Uh, there's been some changes, some actually just recently. Uh, the two of the highest fishing countries of Mako sharks, which is an endangered list, so Spain and Portugal actually said that they will um, regulate the fishing of these animals. So things are coming. There's a lot of push from the public. Again, what can you do? Start pushing, start writing a petition, invite people to do that. And that is something, that is your hook. You have removed the hooks, yeah. you know. And so there is an attempt, but there's also a lot of moving parts to take in consideration. Uh, I think we're moving a little bit too slow compared to what sharks need. Unfortunately, sharks have a, a natural series of characteristics that makes them very vulnerable to our presence, where if I was talking about salmon, that will be very different. So it's just a natural design of the shark that makes them so vulnerable to our fishing and to our environmental pressure, which is they uh, develop sexually very late compared to many other animals. They have... Uh, uh, very few pups, I mean, species can go from one to 100, and 100 sounds like a lot, but when we think that a grouper can produce a 300,000 hatchlings, that 100 is not that much. And they also have very slow reproductive rate. I mean, some sharks only give birth every two years, for example. Some go by size. So now if we start affecting their environment where there's not enough food and they don't reach the right size that can actually not start in reproducing. And on top of that, we are taking away their environment, they, we're taking them away, we're taking away their food, and so the pressure is very, very high. And this is a very slow moving animal, they call them K animals, so they're, they do not adapt to changes fast. Where a salmon with a one year life cycle is much more adaptable to fast changes. Okay, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. I know you do a lot of a lot of research as well um, for other organisations. 
what sort of stuff would you typically do um, for this and what, what does that help to benefit in terms of shark understandings? Well, most of my work is being into what I call citizen science, so I have access to sharks uh, very easily. So it's also collecting data that goes on the long term, because one of the things we need is a baseline. Um, you know, how many sharks do we have? What is their average size? What is their average territory? So it could be something as simple as I do a lot of uh, shark measuring with a photogrammetry, um, put the data up into a, a database a university so that people can actually compare the numbers. If they change, we can also monitor their growth rate. I've been doing some DNA collecting uh, for identifying which diet these sharks have. Is, uh, for example, our presence affecting them? Um, and some of the studies I, would, I didn't contribute, but like there's a paper that just came out on the high, high level of mercury that sharks have uh, in their bodies from obviously pollution of the ocean. So that brings up other issues, which is, oh, eat fish is very healthy for you. And it's just like, and we will have to have a whole full conversation about that nowadays. Um, about how fish is healthy for, for people, and never mind, you know, apex predators or big animals. So that is uh, what I concentrate on. The uh, study that I am currently involved with, that COVID put a stop to it, we never heard that issue before, uh, was uh, trying to figure it out where my specific group of sharks goes mating and giving birth. Because the sharks are completely protected in the Bahamas since 2011. I started together with Pedro Baranda a petition in 2009, and this then was picked up by the Bahama National Trust and a pure organization. And in 2011, the Bahamian government declared all sharks protected all over the Bahamian waters. You cannot even land one dead shark, nothing. Uh, but protecting the sharks themselves that does, does not always benefit them. So my next concern is, are we protecting where they go to give birth, and are we protecting where they leave their pups? And so my next research is going to be into satellite tagging two of my girls because I can recognize them. I know and I have a diary. I know who is going to mate and who is going to give birth. And so satellite tag them, follow them for two or three months to see where they go and pinpoint an area that maybe can be uh, put under a new marine protected area. So that extend also the capability of protecting these sharks. That's brilliant. I love that. Um, I know as well, with, alongside all the other stuff that you're doing, you've also recently started a, an NGO called People of the Water. Can you talk us a little bit about this and what, what's your goals with this? People of the Water uh, was created to, I've been doing this for, I've been a diver, professional diver, like you said, for an awful long time, which is 27 years. <laughs> and I've been, I would say conservation is, I did, you know, slowly evolved into it. But obviously my interest has started about, let's say maybe 20 years ago, slowly thinking about, I need to protect these environments and these animals that are very much loved. In a lot of it, it was a self-finance. So I will work professionally, make money, and then go and take a course or learn something or provide my skills to do some work on the island for free on my free time. But there's only so much you can reach especially you know, working as a diving profession. So the nonprofit was uh, created to allow me to expand these three words that we talked about, the exploration part, the educational part for me, but also to be able to share with others and then to be able to stretch that into conservation. So in the beginning, um, it has started with just helping with some of the tools that we need to purchase in order to continue this work, which is, uh, just going in the cave is uh, to map these caves is quite a lot of uh, investment that you have to do in the gear and in the technology you're bringing in and then hopefully expand that into education. My dream goal is to fulfill actually education of some young girls on the island through the nonprofit into scuba diving and into becoming stewards of the ocean, which is something I already done, but this is something that I would like to do like more on a personal level rather than association with other NGOs or companies. Yeah, excellent. And then I know you touched on it as well earlier when you said some of your research had to go on hold because of COVID. 
is that also impacting your your NGO? And then what could people do to support you? Well, COVID came on the tail end of the beginning of the recovery from Hurricane Dorian, which actually demolished this island in September 2019. So we've been in a strenuous situation since September 2019. Um, definitely COVID has affected my professional life. Uh, I am a diving professional and I haven't had customers in quite a long time and has affected obviously the NGOs, but all NGOs are suffering from that. The best way is one is if people could come and visit, but obviously that is a little bit not at the time, or they can directly support the uh, people of the water through a small donation. And that goes towards continuing our work, especially right now in exploration and the mapping and the education and collecting all the data that we need. Okay. So I've only got one more question left. But if you're watching back home and you'd like to ask a question for me to put towards Christina, please pop it in the comments and I will put it towards her. We've had lots of lovely feedback coming through as we've been talking. Uh, lots of people, Christina, saying that you're doing a great job, fascinating work, and they're absolutely loving the difference that you're trying to do and are making. Um, so the question that I wanted to ask you is, what advice would you give to others that would like to follow in your footsteps? And following on that, what do you know now that you wish you'd have known at the start? <laughs> to, this is a long topic in a way. So there's people that want to follow my in my footstep. I usually tell them that each one of us has a different road, meaning the opportunities that I had 27 years ago are not there anymore or they're there in a different form, but the people that are starting now have opportunities that I could not dream of, including and um, very much what we're doing right now, live Facebook chat. I moved here in 1994, and the only way to have my message reach out was that if anyone came on the boat with me, or if anyone came here to write an article on a printed magazine, or if I was lucky enough, you know, they would do maybe one TV program per year. So nowadays we have the capability of sharing our message. Like what does the giraffe say? The outreach that is doing right now is amazing. So use the tools of your time. And rather than trying to follow my footsteps, think about what is that really strikes you at your core. What is What kind of difference do you want to make? Don't worry about the difference I've made. What kind of difference do you want to make? And what are your potentials? My potentials, luckily, were uh, this kind of like capability into diving. Uh, I was able, I learned so many skills. I'm at all these cards and levels, but I just have this thing for diving and communication. I speak different languages to communicate. Maybe yours is marketing. Maybe yours is uh, journalism and your and not someone else's science. Maybe someone else is capable of translating science into a language that I can understand as well. So think about your potential and then go for it. Understand though that it comes at a price. Okay, it's not served on a silver plate, and I'm not saying this to to dishearten you, but it comes with a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice, and it doesn't come because you show up. And then think laterally, not only vertically. What does it mean? Think about, this is really what you love to do, and this is really what would you like to do, but think about all the other things that could benefit as you build. i give you an example. In 2015, I was invited by NetGeo to join a cave survey expedition, testing new technology to survey the caves. And I was one of the three surveyors that ended up in these caves. And I received messages like, oh, wow, lucky you. I wish I could do that. But the story is I had been traveling to visit these caves for nearly a decade. So I knew the caves very well. I had also been surveying caves for about eight to nine years using the old method. And I was also a cave diver that kept doing this thing. So when at a certain point they were looking for someone that knew the caves, that needed survey using new methodology in an environment where they needed to know where they were and what they were doing, they were like, oh, well, Christina's been coming here for 10 years. So she can join the team. 
So what I'm saying is, I went into Surrey because I really wanted to learn survey, and I was a sidebound cave diver because I really loved that. But then it all came in together. Yeah. So don't just think vertically; think laterally. Um, other, do not discount the power of social media. Right. So uh, be mindful of how you use it. In my opinion, uh, remember people speak different languages and different cultures. So be mindful how you use it, but it has an extreme positive power if used correctly. So you need to learn how to use the social media. You might need to learn how to use the, some of the things that go with social media from taking pictures, editing your pictures, or writing a little bit, editing your writing. So it's quite a lot of skills that go in. If you really want to do what I do, you need two things. You need to move where the ocean is or where the water is that you want to work in, and you need to really work on your scuba diving skills. I know, and there's that, a lot of suggestions. <laughs> I know, I absolutely love that, and I, I completely agree with you on all your points. Um, so how would you suggest for people who maybe haven't really thought about scuba diving before, they've never done it, maybe they're a bit scared to do it, what, what advice would you give to them? Well, there's now many places where you can uh, experience scuba diving, even just in a pool. So if you are not comfortable, you can just try to take your first breath on the water in the confinement of, of a pool. Uh, there are places where you can do what is called the tri-dive. So they actually do the pool and the diving in one day, depending on where you are. Or do the traditional way, go slow. Uh, make sure you find the right instructor. Don't forget to ask questions to your instructors. You are the paying customer. You will have the right to question your instructor, not the instructor just question you. Yeah. So find someone that you uh, fit with. We're all scuba instructors, but we all have different techniques and different way of delivering messages. So go slow. Um, if you're really, really afraid of the water, my first thing will be uh, maybe start swimming and just be comfortable being on the deep end of the pool where you can't touch the bottom. Yeah. Okay, we've got a question come through from um, Laurie Epp, and they are asking, what is the best phrase to say that would inspire care about sharks to people who have feared or hated sharks in the past out of maybe ignorance? Uh, I will go with the one I use, which are there are no monsters in the sea, only the ones we make up in our heads. And then from there, or the other one that you can use is, did you know there are over 522 species of sharks? And the smallest one is the size of a pen. And you pick up a pen and start a conversation from there. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciated um, you coming on today. And thank you everyone back home who's been watching and for all your kind comments. Um, I agree with all of you. Um, Christina, you're doing a fantastic job and thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, Martin. Is there anything that you'd like to finish with before we say goodbye? I just want to remind people to be star throwers, to remember that they have the power of one that you don't need to do one big action to make a difference, that each small action that you do makes you part of the change that you want to see. So go and be a star thrower. I love that. That's an absolutely wonderful way to finish, and I don't think I can add much more to it. Um, so thank you so much for coming on again. Thank you as well, everyone back home. If thank you're you. all watching this and it's not live, you're watching it a bit later on, then please do put any comments or questions into the into the Facebook section and one of us will try our best to get back to you. Um, and if you've enjoyed today's chat and would like to see other interviews with conservationists around the world, then please go on to What Does the Giraffe Say Media on Facebook and you'll be able to see lots of incredible work from incredible people in all different corners of the world. But for now, thank you very much for coming on and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.